Welcome to the Aiki Dojo podcast. I am David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center of Los Angeles, and with me is... Bill D'Angelo, also from the Aikido Center of Los Angeles. Welcome, Bill. It's good to see you, Sensei. How are you this morning? Not too bad. Good. Getting busy for this la- this month of October. Yeah, the it's end gonna... of the year is like, it's like a slope. It just gets faster as it gets closer to the end. Seems like it. In, in Japanese, the month of December, uh, the Japanese translation is like priest run because they get so busy and i could totally see that it's the same thing for me at work we we lose the last week of november to thanksgiving people travel that weekend then we lose the last two weeks of december because no one especially in entertainment works often the whole month of december so it's almost as if for many of us the end of the year is like november 20th (laughs) That's not bad. You get no. the, the month of December off. Well, I'm not getting that time off, but my <laughs> my clients might be. So today, um, we've got an interesting topic, which we, we've touched on the periphery before, and that's uh, the psychology of mastery. Oh. So there are two types of... What are the, what are the two types of psychology of mastery? Well, they're not necessarily types. They're different, two different stages. Okay. Right, because the thing you think about, like modern, I don't know, um, influencers and motivational specialists and all these things, they say stuff like excellence is an all the time thing. Right. And then you think, the other day I was thinking, is excellent excellence an all the time thing? You know, as I was washing my car, right? <laughs> because as you you think about this, when you're a beginner or you're young and you're trying to build yourself up, excellence isn't all the time thing. Right. When you get older and you're more experienced, we strive for excellence. So let me ask you your question about this. What what would you let's say what is the beginning definition of mastery for this discussion? Like what how do you what do you put in that box? Whether it's mastery of Aikido or being a phenomenal detailer of a car what what is mastery and from your perspective as the senior teacher, the sensei of the school? Well, I mean, mastery is this: you're going to pour your all into developing a skill, right? Right, a skill or skill or skill set, and then once you've poured your all into it, you have mastered it, right? That's mastery. But later on, like you know, you say how you do anything is how you do everything. It's true, but on a certain level, it's not. Okay. Right? Down here, how you do anything is how you do everything, which is true. But then when you get older, more experienced, how you do anything is how you do everything is not necessarily true. Because what do you wh- mean by that? When you're when excellence is an all the time thing or how you do anything is how you do everything, you're revving at a hundred. Right. You're you're red you're redlining, you're a thousand, you're it's everything. Your is, concentration is maxed. You you got it every, everything you do is one hundred percent. And that's fine when, you, when you're when you young and you have the energy to do that. But when you get older and you don't have the energy, you don't have the time, you don't have this, all those things, how you do anything and how you do everything doesn't necessarily apply. Excellence is not necessarily an all-the-time thing. It's just something that you strive for. Mm-hmm. So while I was washing my car and I haven't washed it since the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm like, you know, getting in the ins and outs, you just go, oh, my gosh. More problem? Oh, dirt here? Oh, gosh. Dirt, oh, and then, you know, like everything starts to add up. And then you think, well, if if excellence is an all-the-time thing, I guess I'm going to be here till Wednesday washing this car. <laughs> if excellence is an all-the-time thing, then I can't not uh, vacuum out my trunk because excellence is everything. Going is, the whole way yeah. all the time. And, yeah, you're all everything all out. And then you think, well, but I can't because I'm supposed to go to lunch with my wife at 12. Well, then I got it, you know, then you see like it, it creates this grind and that grind is something that you're only supposed to have or do when you're a beginner or when you're young, because that grind, when you get older, well, it just grinds you up. Right. Right. You know, you think, you know, someone was asking me about Yaido and then they were asking me like, you know, should I push through my knee pain? And the person is over 50 and I go, absolutely not. Right. You know, like this article that I'm writing for El Budok magazine is about learn how to listen to your body. You know, David Goggins says that we're only using we're only using 40 percent of our capacity and that our mind says quit at 40. Right. And then we have to push through and you got to push through. 
And then, yes, you push through. But at a certain point and a certain stage, at a certain experience level, a certain age, pushing through, that's how you just ruin your knee. Right. You know, if you look at David Goggins' feet, you look at his hands. He's messed up. He's all messed up. From a Chinese medicine standpoint, if you look at David Goggins' tongue, you're like, whoa, this is bad. But that's the thing. It's like, what's your goal? What are you trying to achieve? And then are you down here or are you up here? Are what's, you... what's the difference between excellence and mastery? Because you're using them a little bit interchangeably. They, they kind of are the same thing. Are they this, the same this, thing? This ex, this, you, are, you are excellent at this craft, which means you are at the very top. You are a master of this craft, right? So, Because one of the things I was thinking, you know, because I know that we're having this discussion. You're the chief instructor. You've been doing Aikido for over three decades. Um, is Does mastery imply the ability to teach what you've learned? No. It does not? No. Okay. Teaching is another skill set. Okay. So you met, let's say we take Aikido, for instance, right? You learn how to do Aikido and you become very competent at Aikido. That's your level of mastery in Aikido. Now, students are supposed to become teachers after a while. And then now you all of a sudden have to, you know, teach this to another person. It's a completely different skill set. How so, you speak to them is different than how you speak to yourself, right? David Goggins is running down the street going, um, you don't know me, son. You don't know me, son. Right? <laughs> so then the student comes in and, and they're they're trying to learn, uh, you know, how to roll. And you're like, you don't know me, son. You don't know yourself. I mean, you don't know yourself. So, I mean, you know yourself. Like, see, you can't use the same vernacular that you use on yourself. But isn't it interesting that... We've already come to, I think, an interesting cultural path conflict here, which is you've probably heard this because you're a practitioner and a teacher. In different areas, I'm a practitioner and teacher. In the West, you hear the following thing all the time. Those who can, do. Those who can't, teach. But that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, does it? No, and that's why academia is, is you know, like if you go into most uh, computer information technology um, majors, they're learning like old outdated languages of code today they're using code in a different way but what what school does teach you it teaches you how to learn right but yeah the person who does not know teaches but that doesn't necessarily apply to the martial arts it, it, it can there are people like i knew someone who was a horrible aikidoist great coach great coach and the students were really competent but i know people that are excellent martial artists horrible coaches Horrible teachers. So it's, it's teaching is really it's an additional skill on top of your mastery of the yeah. of the curriculum. It is a completely new skill because now you have to take in, compa- in, in, in into account compassion. You know, um, in the old days, it was I don't care what your problem is, do it exactly the way I tell, tell you. you. I don't want no questions asked. You got to just do this thing. Today we say we must meet the student where they are. Hmm. And then, you know, people, conservative people. When do you are, think that first started coming in on, in the West from teaching in martial arts? Was it 20, 30 years ago? Is it 10 know, years ago? Maybe the last 10 years or last something. 10, like, years. 10, 15 years, 20 years. Because you cannot, especially when a person comes in older. Right. Older, less skillful, out of shape. You can't just go, just do it. So like my knee kind of hurts. And you go, I don't care if your knee hurts. And then they go, oh, Sensei, I'm going to have to take a couple of weeks off because my meniscus is torn now. And, you and go, then they never come back. Yeah. And then you go, darn it. What did I do? But so the, you, were, you were talking about that at our, our students meeting yesterday. Yeah. Well, but just, it doesn't matter what age you are. The age in which we are living in, nobody wants to be told what to do. <laughs> I don't care who you are, what side of the party line, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, nobody wants, wants to be, be told, told what to, to do. do. And because no one wants to be told what to do, you cannot force upon them your will. In the old days, the teacher forced upon you their will. You know, that's that old joke from the military. This is a test of wills and you will lose, <laughs> right? And like, but in today, you can't use your will on the student. Doesn't they'll, work. They'll quit. And so you must meet the student where they are. So you spend this time with the student trying to figure out what they can do and then use that as a stepping stone to more skill. So for a teacher, is that a harder paradigm to be in? Because you have to, instead of where the teacher imposes their will, which is basically one person's will controls everything, so it's a simpler system. But if you have to tailor everything to each individual student, you really have to get to know your students. Yeah. Yeah. 
and and you you have to look at them. You have to think, oh, this person. You take all these things into account: their age, their physical ability, what they've learned before, um, any type of uh, you know their their physical capacity, and then you have to think, well, okay, so then, yeah, that koshinagi is not the best thing today, right? You know, oh, the guy. Everybody in the room's got knee problem. Eh, probably not Swati was it today. today. So this brings up an interesting question, which I think we've talked about in the past in a different context. But um, is the way that you're talking about mastery related to the historical difference between the Do and the Jutsu skill set? Yes. Yeah, I guess you can look at it like that. That is a yeah. good way to put it. Because Jutsu is like, I don't give a crap. Do what I said to do. This will make you good. Right. And Don't question. You, and then you as student know that this person is a winning um, uh, coaching style. So you go, hi. But the person of today, you're trying to develop them in and out. And so you have to try to figure out who they are. You can't so, just go, just do it. I don't care what your problem is. The other part I was thinking about this, and I'm interested to get your point of view on this, is when I when that question came to mind as I was preparing for today, one of the things I was thinking of is that we we talk of do as more about self mastery mastery over the your your own inner personhood whereas jutsu as you said it, there is a there is a curriculum of techniques that the teacher is the expert you're the student and it's a it's a one way relationship where i think do is much more complicated in a way it, right it, it is but it's not supposed to be but that's okay. the modern age that we live in right so jutsu and do right Jutsu is really the outside. It's just a physical technique. Right. So Do is the inner, right? The road that you're really, you're really like your intent going down. It, it's it's the inside of you, that, and that's what I was saying before. It's like <clears throat> you, you begin out. You be as a beginner or as a young person, you're developing your physical body. Right. So it's all physical. It's all jutsu. But when you get older, it's all do. Right. For me to finish washing my car to a satisfactory level. As I get tired and it's hot and I really don't care, it creates, you need mental fortitude to finish. And there may be a point where you say, I'm going to go to the car wash and leave it to the expert. Yes. But, I, <laughs> but I'm trying to save money or whatever it is, right? But they, you see how like the, the quandary became less physical and more mental because now you go, man, I spent three and a half hours washing and cleaning my car that I could have taken to the car 30 wash. 30 minutes. Yeah, less than 30, in and out in 22 minutes. Right, and maybe done a better job. Yeah, because they know how to do it. They have the tools, you know, they're they're efficient. But see, that's that thing where every, as you become more experienced or you become older, it it's all, all becomes a, a mental game. So this, this brings up another question that I had in preparation, which was, um, how is mastery in Aikido, or for you, mastery in Chinese medicine, um, has it influenced your path of mastery in traditional Aikido? Well, the thing about tr uh, mastery in martial arts, anything traditional, is that the higher you go, the more you realize you don't know. Hmm. And so, me, I, mine is more existential. I go, man, I don't know nothing. How do you get, you know, people tell me, oh, I'm a really good teacher. I'm really good at developing people. And I just go, how did you do that? Wow. Well, what do you do? You know, or you see someone with, you know, 200 students and you're just like, how did that happen? But then you look at the students, and you go, oh, he, that person was at the right place at the right time to the thing. They're a horrible teacher. But also what you're talking about is I think is very interesting, which is at the higher level of mastery, there's still the ability to experience wonder. Um. Yes. At, at things in your practice and, and things in your teaching style. Well, the, you're you're always supposed to be looking for wonderment, right? That this thing where you go, whoa. But that's ha but that has more to do with this idea of having an open mind. Mm. That, But we're talking about this idea of mastery where you, I know what to do. You know, patients come into the clinic and some of them have like these really complicated Problems. situations. And then I spend two hours figuring it out. And then I go, this is what I would do if I was you. And then they go, are you just going to put the needles in or not? <laughs> and I go, I know, but I mean, if you just do this and do this and not right. eat this, this not, and eat this. People don't want to be masters yeah. most of the time. Well, yeah, I would say largely, if the numbers are correct, 90% of the people do not want to be, want, do not want to have mastery over themselves. Right. They all want to have mastery 
over their situation or their circumstance, but they do not want to have mastery but is over there, themselves. But is there something specific, because I can think of it in law, but is there something specific to Chinese medicine and, and your path to becoming a high-level practitioner? Were there any lessons along the way? And you're like, oh, I'm going to steal that from my Aikido. Yeah, all the time. All the time. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, to me, like, I, I think there's a lot of crossover. I think, like, there's a structure to mastery. Like mastery, ha- and I, I've got some notes to talk about that, but I do think that there might be a structure to mastery. And so if you're practicing at a high level in some other thing, and then you look at that and you're like, oh man, that's a, sh-. we talked about this before with hacks. Like maybe I learned something here and it's a shortcut to going two steps up, which normally I would have had to slog through. You think that that it's the case that you would you would s- catch a nugget here and then that opens the door for every, all these things. It is and it is not true. So if you look at someone who built, who bakes a cake, baking a cake and doing Aikido techniques are no different, right? So like if you look at this this uh, picture, it says the sword and the lute have the same origin, right? This, the origin is the person who who has to develop themselves in order to play the lute, this violin, I mean this guitar-looking not, I don't know what you call this lute, or it's like the standard. I know, thing I know this. you're talking the about the lute and the sword. They have the same origin, which is the person has to develop themselves to th- use it. To use it, right? Whether it be a sword, a lute, a banjo, tennis racket. So this is maybe stating the obvious, but I'm going to do it anyways. One element of mastery, for sure, is high standards. Yes, you have to have this unwavering standard, which won't allow you to waver from this thing. You know, like when you see, you talk to people and they're like, oh, yeah, I used to train with this person or I used to train with that person. They jump ship. That person's got no standards, Mm. right? Because they say, I was reading some online um, post where they they said someone wrote, after third dawn, you can never leave your teacher, which is kind of true. And the reason why it's true is that because that person spent all their time and energy developing you and then you stayed and allowed them to develop you. So good, bad, right, or wrong, you got to stay. But then the thing is, you know, when I always talk about this idea that the the best teacher is the one that's the most unreasonable. Right. They're right. unreasonable because you cannot get them to teach you the way you want to be taught. So if they're a really bad teacher, you have to train yourself really hard and long to get good. So then the unreasonable teacher made you better. If they're a really good teacher, you're going to have to work really, really hard to get good. So see how like it doesn't it's, matter. It's doesn't the most matter. unreasonable teacher is the one you want, not the one who tells you the way you want it. And so that's why the, today you think about the, the psychology of mastery is really physical and mental. They're, the one at the bottom is the physical mastery. You're looking for a really good coach. Turn your foot here. No, you're you're more at 47 degrees, got to be 45 degrees. 45 degrees you know, enables you to create the maximum amount of power. Oh, okay. And then you go about trying to get at 45 degrees. But later on, the mastery of that psychology is the thing that forces you to try to f- keep it at 45 degrees because you're, you are, you're trying your best to make this thing happen. And then somewhere along the line, you would just give up. So is mastery, based on what you're just saying, is mastery liberating or is it constricting? That's that thing, like when, we're, we're, when we started out talking about excellence is an all the time thing. See, that becomes very constricting. Right. And at the bottom, in the beginning, it has to be very constricting. You can't learn five different styles of Aikido at right. once. You have to learn one, one style. Yeah. Right. You know, and you hear people talk about, <clears throat> well, you should be collaborating. You should learn 45 different Ikkyos. No. You learn one ikkyo really, really well and then apply that ikkyo to 45, Different circumstances. 45 other ikkyos, right? But that that's that thing. Like You, you want to try to understand excellence is an all-the-time thing down here, yes. But then when you get up to the higher levels, excellence is really something that you have to strive for because the constricting constrictingness of excellence down here creates no balance. Right. And then to live a good life, you have to have balance. Balance is, is key. Yeah. You can't be this like 55-year-old dude grinding it out, single, you know, have a crappy job because you can quit and just go off to an Aikido seminar, you know, and like you're in great shape. You got no, no responsibilities, no money in the bank. 
you could do that, but it's it's a really lonely place to live. Right. Having children, having a spouse, having friends, going out to dinner. Maybe having another job. Having a job, whatever it is, those things create balance for you, right? Because down here when you're young and you have time, and that's the best time to constrict yourself, you could be a bit out of, ba- out of balance. But then when you get older, not it having— is liber- At the highest level, it, it's liberating. It allows you to, to navigate all the different complex elements of, of your life. Yeah, because when you're sick— and there's no one to tend to you, you go, well, was it all worth it? Yeah, right. I got a beautiful front kick, crescent <laughs> kick. I got a great irimi but man, I don't feel so well, and I wish someone was here to comfort yeah. me, right? So, I mean, that's the, like, you, that's where jitsu becomes do. Do requires that you have to have balance. Right. Jitsu, you can be out of balance. You can be a killer. You can be a jerk. But when you, when you move into do, do, the psychology of mastery, forces you that you cannot be a jerk anymore. Right. There's an element of humanity and humility to it. All that stuff. Yeah. And so when you sit back and you think about this idea of it, yes, it's, it has to be constricting down here because you must learn the form. In the shu hari. I was just about right? to ask that. So you, can, you, you got that. Shu and, shu and ha are down here constricting. Ri up So here. for those that don't know shu hari, can you just do like a 30 second rewind and explain what each of the elements means and then how you translate them into what you're talking about right now. Well, shu is the this idea where you are mastering the form. Okay. Exactly the way it's taught to you. So similar to a jutsu level yeah. understanding. Ha are teasing out the details. So you know exactly toe's supposed to be pointing here. The refinements. Knee over foot, all these different whatever the refinement is. And then so shu ha ri Ri is to, to break the form, right? And breaking the form, you're not leaving the form, right? That's that uh, shikuzokuzeiku in Buddhism. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Mm. You have to have form in order to create this, this liberation, right? So supposedly um, the uh, Siddhartha is meditating under the Bodhi tree and a woman gives him uh, uh, milk curds and he eats it. And those, the students see that and run away. And then he realizes, oh, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Without this food, I cannot live. Right. That's the form. And then the emptiness is to be able to transcend that. So he runs after the students and gets them back and explains to them, shikizoku zeiku. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. To have emptiness, you must have form. And that's very, it's a very Japanese, it's a very Eastern concept. That right. they don't have, they think for everybody in, in the West thinks form is just being able to dunk the basketball well. Right. Right. And then being a horrible person flashing your gun on the street after that. <laughs> no, but he could d- dunk the basketball really well. Yeah, that's jitsu. So, I, in preparation for today, I read this really interesting article by a, a psychologist I'd never heard of before. His name's Albert Bandura. I don't know if you've heard of him. But he has this theory about mastery, which he, he puts at the same level with self efficacy. He says there's four things of ways you become a master. The first one is mastery experiences, um, which he talks about as like new challenges that you face. Then vicarious experience where you have a role model, like you watch the teacher perform the element. And then the last two, one is social persuasion, where the teacher um, skillfully employs like Things like, oh, you're doing really well right here. Or, no, you got to, you need to fix this. And you use, like, verbal cues to elicit performance. And the last one is, I, I, to me, the most interesting, which is um, emotional states make you open or closed to mastery experiences. So if you're very, very depressed, it's hard to work on your mastery experiences. If, but if you can cultivate an open mind, a balance of circumstance, then you could create the emotional availability for mastery. I thought, I just I mean I don't know if we had to talk all about all four of these things, but I thought they were they were a nice way to like boundary in this idea of mastery. So what level do you think you're at? <clears throat> That's an interesting question. I mean, I I feel like I'm still at number 1 new challenges. I I feel like I'm still trying to get up the ladder. Uh, in everything that I do. Um, on, on emotional states, I mean, I, I think that I'm definitely at a higher level than I was 10 years ago. I think that I, For me, the biggest improvement has been my emotional 
foundation. But the other three, you know, mastery experiences, vicarious experience, I think so I think I'm doing okay on the third and the fourth. So social persuasion, I think I have good teachers, whether it's in Aikido or in work. Um, although now that I'm getting in my mid fifties, it turns out like on any given day, I might be the only person who's the expert in the firm. And that's a sobering feeling. Like you're like, when did that happen? But it happened. And now people are asking you, hey, what's the answer to this? I don't know. You're the only person that, you know, on paper should have the answer. And that that's a that's a humbling experience. Mm. It's hard because like each one it theoretically we are doing all of them Four at, at the same time. All of them at the same time. I myself am more in this the openness idea that not being a closed off, but that to, to see the world See, like on a certain level as a martial artist, you have to see the world as being negative and bad. And right, because you're you. always balancing or preparing for a potentially bad outcome. Because you owe, to be to be ready, you have to at least be 51% on. You can never be 50-50. If you're 50-50, you're going to be slept on. Right. Right? If you're 49 um, awake and 51 asleep, you're going to lose. You have to be at least be 51% on the ready. And that's where that this idea of excellence is an all the time thing. Right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you don't you don't wear flip flops. You when you go to Disneyland, you gotta have a gun and a knife. And then like see how like it really starts to create this grind on you right. that you can't excellence is not something that you can do all the time. It has to be something you at a certain level, it has to be something that you strive for. But most people can't understand that that yeah, because how you do anything is how you do everything. everything. Right? We this one thing will show your true level of training. So you go, oh yeah, how you do anything is how you do everything. So like, but then you strive to be how you do anything is how you do everything, to be mindful of the things that you do. But then if you do, if you have the everything is, how you do anything is how you do everything mindset or an ec- my, or excellence is an all the time thing, how, how do you get eight hours of sleep? Right, but there is a sense from long training that you groove, you you create grooves, right? Where like you naturally slot in like on a train track to certain behavior or preparations. And maybe, and this is a question, does, does, does working that groove over decades make mastery easier when you're older? I used to think it would. But you but don't anymore. As I get older, you go, man, it's all mental. Mm. It's all mental. It's 100% mental. Like I talked about in one of the last podcasts, David Goggins' book, You Can't Hurt Me. Mm-hmm. It's it's just stories intersprinkled with his the mind games he plays with himself. Right. Right? David Goggins is running down the street going, you don't know me, son. You don't know. Who's he talking to? Himself. Himself. Yeah. Right? He's he's yelling at himself to spur him, himself forward. Right? It's all mind games. Right, so you play these mind games with yourself, like like I said, when I'm you're washing the car, and I just got I got like three hours into it, and I'm like, man, I wish I'd have washed this thing throughout the pandemic, <laughs> right? And then you go, oh, I guess excellence isn't an all the time thing. I, what was I thinking? And then after three hours, I was like, my back hurts, oh, man. And then you want to give up, but then you can't because the car will only be half washed, right? But had you had you lived in the Excellence is an all-the-time thing. You've been washed from the beginning, right? And it'd be fine. So see how, like, you have to really ask yourself, what does that mean? You know, you you make your son walk to school in the rain because to punish them because how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. And excellence is an all-the-time thing. I'm teaching him how to be a man as he's crying and doing soaking all this stuff. Wet. Soaking wet. You learned a good lesson today, didn't you? And, you know, you think that's crazy, but my... There's a neighbor in my area. I saw him kind of do that. Wow. And then I always see him and his kid at the park. The kid's hitting hitting balls, <laughs> crying the whole time. Mm. Right? I see him riding the bike, crying. I see him walking in the rain, crying. And I think, yeah, I mean, he's making his kid a man at eight years old. Right. <laughs> Ten years a little early. But, I mean, you don't know what the harmful experiences that you're putting into this person's brain. And then that person snaps. Right. Because 
you know, like I was, they were showing some Chinese kid who was playing basketball and he's like crying and he does a layup and then, you know, he scores and then they, they pass the ball and he has his keeper and they're like, you know, he's crying and all this stuff or, or they have this, they have this, this, this famous meme has a Shaolin monk kid crying, doing a, a horse stance, <laughs> holding up a stick and they said, curing ADHD since, you know, 1200 AD. And you think, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe. But then does that person turn into a psychopath? Right. Because when they're young, you're supposed to nurture them. Not well, that's, that's one of the things I like about what you said today, which is there's an element of compassion when you receive or achieve mastery that you're like, oh, I really understand other people's struggles, other people's striving for excellence and, and the things that knock people down. Yeah. And then you have the old like tiger moms, Chinese tiger moms. Yeah. They don't care if you're upset. They're giving you a future right? by pushing you, making you go to school, do all these things and get good grades and become a doctor or a lawyer, even though you don't want to be. Right. They're giving you a livelihood and a future. It's right. for your own good, even though you hate it and even though you hate me. Right. Right. Like I had this doctor who in the office, there was all these these paintings around. And I was like, I go, hey, did you do these paintings? And he goes, yeah. And he he's a friend of the dojo, right? His son went to the dojo. He was the worst doctor, but the, 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 it was a really great painter. Great painter, but I mean, really nice office, state of the art, and everything. He didn't look up once from the keyboard. He misdiagnosed me three times, and I was like, "This guy's an idiot." But then yeah. I thought, "Oh, he's just a painter who's pretending to be a doctor." Yeah, that's right? tough. Yeah, and that's and that's the hard part about martial arts today. Martial arts teachers are martial arts teachers that are pretending to be businessmen, or businessmen pretending to be, be martial, martial arts teachers. There's not so th a, this this. Brings up, I think, it was my biggest question I was holding in reserve, which I know we've talked about before, but I think we can give it a bigger send off here. There is, I think, there has been historically, whether in ancient Greek culture or 19th century England, or even sometimes maybe in more fatalist philosophies, that talent is more important than effort. No, that, I don't know. Is that true? What's what's the quote? I think for that? those things, I mean, I could find the quotes for it that people believe like you were innately like destined to be a warrior. Like Achilles, Achilles doesn't have any better training than anyone. He's fated by the gods to be the greatest warrior ever. But did he have to apply himself? Well, I suppose he... that they would say you need to do both. Like because the ancient Greeks trained all the time, every day. But there was this, there were these collateral beliefs that there was some element of by fate, you were who you were. And I wanted to bring it up because you and I have had offline conversations yeah. about this. Yeah. No, you, you're not wrong. Some We are fated to be who we are. He, the, uh, Achilles is fated to be a warrior. I'm fated to be an Aikido teacher. We are fated to be who we are, but the effort, the the hard work is who, what makes us who we are. Right. Right. And that if, if we, you know, if you look at some of these uh, – Traditional martial arts in Japanese, uh, dento, dento to you. Dento means like traditional, tradition. Like these people, there are people in Japan that are certifying ranks that don't even have any skill in the rank, but they just have to have, be born into that family and they just rubber stamp these ranks. The sokes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, 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 art, the art only continues as a familial thing, but n not through the actual physical movement. Right. Right. And if we... If we if we say things are I mean things are we there is this idea you know, you know like I'm more fati you know to love fate and that's the way it's supposed to become right my 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 parents treated me a certain way which causes me to be Use this it. way and that this is that was the impetus for this right and then we look only when we look backwards can we see oh yeah that makes sense when my dad beat me up or my this thing happened that girl said no at the prom. Those things made me who I am today. Oh, only when we look backwards. Looking forward, you just go, life sucks. Well, I Everybody. know that you're you're a kinesiologist by training yeah. in college. Um, I need to find this article and send it to you, and we should even post it. There is a recent article that was done on elite athletes. Mm -hmm. And what they found was there was not a good historical correlation between the people who were at the top of their sport in high school with being in the top of their sport at the professional level. Yeah. And that they that that early jump 
declines as people train and develop their effort. And truly, people who were middle of the pack in high school can end up being gold medalists in their discipline as yeah, adults. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, if you all you would have to do is look at the NC2A MVPs and then lay that over uh, NBA. Later success. Later success in the NBA. Not there. Yeah. Michigan's Mateen Cleaves didn't even make it in the NBA. Um, there was a guy in the Lakers. I can't remember. He went to Gonzaga. Um, was it was it Lonzo? No. No, he made the NBA. He, they, they made the NBA. And they're pretty good. I hated them in the beginning, but maybe they're not too bad. But like, um, but there was all these people that were MVPs in the NC2A tournament. And they burn out. They didn't burn out. They didn't even make it. Right. They get surpassed. Well, because some of it, it's... They were on a good team, which created the opportunity for them to be winners. Right. They didn't necessarily excel over these people, other people. Right. So I would say largely, I, if I if I had to guess, eighty percent of the people that are become MVPs in the NC2A don't go on to the NBA. Maybe. I mean, you have um, <clears throat> you have some people, right? So when Carmelo students come Anthony, to but, talk to you about training in Aikido. Um, do you ever talk about this balance between talent and effort, or do you just try to not talk about it at all? I don't know what to talk about with people anymore. I used to I I used to sell it to them because I used to be good at sales. Mm-hmm. So I listen to them talk, and then I you figure out re-talk it in the way in which sells it to them. Right. But then those people never last. Right. I I don't know what to tell people. Hey, you know, you want to be a better person. You want to be a killer. You want to be this. You want to be that. Like. Most people aren't looking for those things, right? And so the hard part is that it's not – it really honestly has nothing to do with talent. T- talent only goes so far, you know. You really should feel sorry for the natural. I know s- tons of people that were black belts before me, you know, or black in a, in a black belt class before me that were so talented. Don't do IQ at all anymore. Wow. They didn't have the longevity. They didn't – you know, and, and then everyone, you know, says stuff to me like, oh, David thinks he's so awesome. And, you know, I was way better than David. You go, yeah. The only thing that David has is determination. Sticking to it. stick to itiveness, right? So, I mean, mastery, it, to a certain extent, mastery has a huge perseverance twinge to it. Because you, you got to be able to get over all the little bumps and bruises and trials and tribulations. And so... Mastery, mastery is a, dare I say, a mindset, but it's something you strive for, right? But if we tell people to strive for it in the beginning. It's overwhelming. Well, no, laziness might come in and then they just quit because they're still, hey, I'm still striving for it, drinking beers. Come, I'll come back to it. But you have to say, no, you got to come every day. And that's why when Fruit Sensei was, was alive, he's like, you have to come every day. And I was like, oh, I don't want to come every day. And mind you. I, we, I talk about this all the time. Everyone thinks, oh, David went every day. I like, did, not. did not. I was the most lazy student. But what I have is talent. My my grandparents and my aunts were like famous Korean dancers, right? And so you have that in your DNA. Right. But what? Right. where would I be today if I really applied myself? Oh, man, I'd probably be much better than I am. But you think you didn't know it. You didn't have the... The mind, the mindset to strive towards mastery, right, right, and that's the hard part. The technique, ability, capability, it comes and goes, but the thing that never changes is your mind, and so that's why you have to constantly be hardening your mind. Your mind is the battleground. Yeah. Should I go to class today? Uh, I don't know, man. Oh, Pawn Stars is on. I'll just watch that. So there's this one quote I ran into in my various researches for today, and I think it it kind of captures what you're saying, which is mastery is a way of taking control of your life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because what you were just saying, you're just saying like, I don't know if I want to go to class today, but if you're on the path to mastery, you're like, I need to take advantage of every opportunity. Well, like you know, I was thinking to myself. As Nietzsche would say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Right. Which is true. But that doesn't mean you won't be sore as hell the next right. the next night and can't sleep. Cause, Cause the other day I was like, you know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Cause I always do this like five mile hike right. behind my house. And I was tired and I go, Well, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And then I did it. And it was no you know, I was able to get through it. 
But then the, in that night, you were miserable. I was so miserable because my hip was so yeah. sore, I couldn't sleep. And I go, well, I guess what doesn't kill you d- uh, makes you stronger, but you also might be super sore, right? But so like, see how like y- using that mantra, what doesn't kill you makes you str- what doesn't kill you makes you stronger down here really drives you forward. But up here, you go, you know, I got this in my body, right? You know, and so. That's the harder thing. It's like, yeah, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but then it blows out your knee. Right. Or worse. Yeah. Or you know, hurts your back or ruins your spousal relationship because, yeah, honey, I'm going to the dojo because whatever is kill you makes you stronger. Then your wife goes, I want a divorce. So I want to I want to run a, a paradigm by you and see if it resonates with you. And if it doesn't, we can just chuck it. So another thing that I that I came across was the difference between mastery goals and performance goals. And this is, this is what the psychologist had to say about this, that mastery goals involve improving your self-knowledge or your skills. They tend to be long-term focused, and they're ultimately about achieving aspirations. Whereas a performance goal usually is like comp- competition-based, so it's relative to others. It's short-term, meaning if you run that 9.3, 100, you don't necessarily have to ever run it again. Um, and um, it's it's often success as part of a team or success as part of a company rather than self-focus. I was just curious, did, did any of those ideas resonate with the way you think about mastery? I, no, I mean, Not I don't really. think, I mean, I do think about performance goals now that I'm older, but mm-hmm. before I was just, before I was the, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Got it. I'm not a wimp. I don't care if I'm tired. I don't care if I'm on vacation. When I went on vacation, I still did cardio the, every right. day on vacation. I still woke up at 5.30 in the morning, did cardio for an hour or two before everyone got up because I'm not going to get beaten by other people. right? right. But like, So when you think about this idea that performance goals create are the small steps of mastery goals. Right? I like so that like idea. You go, I'm going to... I'm going to go to the dojo every day for 100 days. That's a performance goal. Right. right? But you're doing that to get to force yourself to have discipline. You're doing that to force yourself to, you know, do something which creates this mastery goal. Right. The, that's just the hard part that, you know, not on my... So you see them as working together rather than being separate. Yeah. Well, I mean, you... Because remember, it's all it's all mind game. It's this is... Everything in your life is a mind game, right? And performance goals enable you to stay in the game because you say to yourself, I'm only... I'm going to run to that telephone pole. And then you're running, you're tired, and you go, okay... Uh, one more I'm, time. Okay, one more time, that those are performance goals. But by doing that, you're forcing yourself toward mastery, right? Because your your goal was to run a run a five k or ten k. So or in something. a martial art that has no competitive component to it, what do you see? You know, looking at students coming up the ranks, or or teachers, you know, coming up the teacher ranks. What are performance goals that you look at to evaluate yourself and others? You know, non competitive martial arts as a arts? teacher or as a practitioner. Both. I mean, as maybe pra- one first, the other one next. As, as a practitioner, like the smoothness of my movement, to catch the timing, you know, what's you know, how does my body feel? Right now, I'm 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 long time chronically injured, right? I, I have like all of us in our yeah mid I mean, late forties, early fifties. I have two separated shoulders that it was fine until you got old, and then now their arthritis is coming in, right? Right, and so. Rolling is much more difficult. Break falling is even harder. But then to not give up, right? That's that's this mastery goal, to not give up, to find a way around it. I mean, every night, and I'm not even lying, I would say every night, five to seven days a week, I spend two hours stretching, massaging, oh God. working out my neck, my shoulders, my knee, and all these things to stay limber enough to do these things, right? right? Self-care. Yeah, I mean, because you're trying to figure out as a practitioner, you think, okay, the metric is, can I throw this guy down? Right. Right. You have this one person in the dojo you can't throw down. Right. So, you you know, you, you're throwing them down. But then in order to throw them down as you get older, you just have to become rougher. And that's not the point. The point is to become smoother, softer, effortless. Right. But in order to do it, you got to rough them up a bit. So, like, that that's what people kind of use as their metric, just, you know, as a – performance goal. Well, right? I like what you're talking about, this self-care, because I remember you and I had a conversation, I think I'm pretty sure it was offline, 
And we were talking about inspirational teachers. And you mentioned how it's Tsukunuma Sensei is... Um, yeah, Tsukunuma Sensei does yoga. He does a lot of yoga. He does he's Zen, meditation, and yoga. But well, but that's, that's the hard part. Like when you get... When you become older, more experienced, right? You need more rest. Right. So you have to care for your body. Can you do four days in a row? No, well, you can't. Probably Maybe could. two or three, but you you can. But then at some point, it's going to get you. Right. Right. And that's where an overuse injury happens. the The other day, um, we came back from camping, and I was unpacking the top of my car, and I was wearing flip flops, which I know I shouldn't be, and I jumped off the back bumper and my slept and slipped and fell down and then did like a half backward roll you know but you know i didn't roll my ankle and i was like oh this could have been way worse but that hubris of doing it in flip-flops you know not asking my wife to help me and then jumping off the bumper i mean i i could be like well bill my knee i blew out my knee doing that you know because the dumbest things happen right but i mean and then as a teacher you know you're trying to say to yourself how do i teach people better there's this idea that, you know, free sense used to say that oh, Aikido was only for the elite. And I think yeah. I've talked about this before. And I always thought he was talking about class status. But later on, before he died, he starts saying Aikido is, you know, egalitarian. Those who put in the work will get good. So there's this idea that the elite person has the discipline to apply themselves to get good. But today, I look, I don't think that's the right idea. Because all we all dojos become are filled with people who have the discipline to get themselves good. Right. Those are those are ten percenters. <clears throat> the thing about it is that this the the, the person just so like there's this old Buddhist story where all the students go to the master and they say this this one person this one you know junior priest is lazy he doesn't study the sutras he doesn't do his work he you know he doesn't help out at all right. all he does is eat food and sleep. We should kick him out. And then the master says, all of you can leave. But this person, I will stay and try to teach this person. All of you understand. All of you already have the, the work ethic. All of you already get it. Interesting. You, you don't need me. You can all leave. I will stay to teach this one person who can't be taught. It's kind of like the bodhisattva principle yeah. a little bit, right? So then the, the thing is, as a teacher, you have to sit there and think about anyone can teach a person who's already a lawyer, already a doctor. They already have the drive to make themselves good. Right. But how do you teach this person who's, uh, you know, a little bit reckless, a little bit juvenile, you know, standoffish, doesn't believe? That's real teaching. Right. Right. And so Making a difference. Not necessarily make a difference. That you can get through to the person who no one else can get through to. Right. That's mastery. Um, I think that's a really good point to make, Sensei, because um, we were just talking previously about talent versus effort. And I, what struck my mind as you were saying that was it's easier to be the teacher who teaches talented students, but you have to develop compassion, development planning, all these other things to, to look at the people that need the teaching the most. Right. Which is the difference between being the practitioner versus being the teacher. Yeah, as a practitioner, you only think of yourself. As right. a teacher, you have to be selfless. I mean, I think as the, as we're talking about the whole thing today, um, the, the one thing that's kind of stuck in the back of my mind, maybe the elephant in the room, um, is what is the relationship between rank and mastery? Nothing. Nothing. Well, today we would assume that a someone certain who's level of a rank. six don, shihan, seven don, uh, renshi, or something like that, someone with a high rank and a teaching title should be an excellent teacher. But that's not always the case. Because again, you are lucky enough to have a whole lot of students and be good yourself, and then everyone thinks you're good. Right. But that's not necessarily the case, right? You have to be a person who can get through to anyone, right? No matter what it is. But so, I mean, if you're sixth Don Shihan, and I, you know, from an Aikido standpoint, se- sixth or seventh Don Shihan is the highest you're ever going to go right. outside of Japan. So that's a very high indication, external indication of mastery, but it may not track mastery. Well, today, in today's marketplace, it doesn't. These these things can be given given to people that don't necessarily deserve them. Right. You served your time. You paid your money. You. You stuck with this teacher long enough, 
they rewarded you with shihan prior to their death. Right. Right. Time and grade. Yeah, and so that doesn't necessarily mean that you're the you are the best. It was it just means you're the last person standing. Right. You know, and then you know sometimes the last person standing is really good, but it doesn't necessarily it, it they don't equate. They're just, those are just I mean in Aikido. Now we're talking about kendo, a little bit different, right? Because kendo it's a lot harder. Even though I do hear today that there is still tomfoolery in getting the eighth dawn. Really? Test. Oh yeah, right. Because I, I always thought. I mean, I I didn't know. I don't know kendo very well. But my understanding, I know you did kendo. They do have a external testing up to eighth dawn, right? Which is insane. Yeah, which is in Japan, it's really hard to become a lawyer. It's harder to it's harder to become. Eighth on in Kendall than it is a lawyer in Japan. Yeah, it's very high level. Yeah, it's like one percent or something <sighs> like that. But that's that thing. Like we would we would hope in 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 an ultimate world and in, in the best world, the person who has a high rank and a, and a teaching title tracks. It tracks. They are the person who they they say they are, right? And then you go and you meet these people and you go, "What the heck? This person's horrible," right? But like. And then teaching seminars is different than teaching class. There's there's embu or demonstration aikido. There's teaching aikido. There's you know all these different aikido. yeah. So I mean like uh, uh, you see some famous person teaching aikido at a seminar. That may not be how they really teach. Right. Right. Because there's 2,500 people in the room or 200 people in the room. You can't go around. Yeah, to you're inspiring person. versus transmitting. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. But that's the thing. Most people think, oh, no, I'm teaching everybody in the room. Eh, I don't know about that. Especially like if Doshi or Dojo Cho comes and they're trying to teach everybody to be on the same page as standardized Aikido. It doesn't work because you look around the room. No most one's doing of those it. people are doing their own thing. Yeah. Right. And then, then Aikido becomes watered down, right? Because the people don't have a master's mindset. Everyone's jumping straight to Do. They never go through Jitsu. Right. Right. And then because you never went through jitsu, then Aikido is just this phenomenal, you know, spiritual. esoteric spiritual practice. And then your student goes off in the world, gets mugged, can't use Aikido. Right. Like there's a student here, a friend of hers said, who's a high level Aikidoist, she said, Oh, I, Aikido is not a martial art at all. But I've been studying Aikido for 40 years. And you're like, Oh, man. And I was like, Oh, that's rough. That is, that you are, that is, you are not in the right place. Right. Like, but, you know, not everybody does Aikido as a martial art. Right. We, this Aikido Center of Los Angeles, we do it as a martial art. Right. Martial art first, spiritual practice, way, way, way second. So, as we're getting near the end of the, the, end of the hour, I kind of reserved this question for last. But we, and we, if we have more after, that's great. What, what specifically do you recall, either in a positive or negative way, of how our teacher, for instance, a prepared students for mastery or did he it's hard to say um for since he did aikido as a martial art so it was heavily jitsu favored right right turn your hip here break their balance there twist here move here you know honestly very basics focus yeah honestly like most teachers <clears throat> for since they included um, they're all just jitsu teachers. Very few are are really do level teachers, and re the reason why I say that is because the teacher must reflect back on student a better version upon themselves. Right. So when you look at the teacher, you see a better version of yourself, right? And then wow. So when you're you're uh, under this teacher. You know, like I was at some school in Colorado and the guy goes, yeah, I go to the strip club with my students. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like, that is crazy. Or the one guy said, oh, the, the best thing, this other dojo I went to, this teacher said, the best thing about being an Aikido teacher, oh, you always have someone to date. And I was like, whoa, dude, like, you know, don't say that to me. And I lost all respect for that person. Yeah. Right? Because I personally want the person to be a dough level teacher. Now, Fru Sensei was on a certain level a do level teacher, you know, but on a certain level he was not. Right. Because you have to stay with the teacher long enough, train hard enough to get to the level where the teacher starts talking to you about the inner aspects of Aikido. Right. And only when, right, the reason why I say Fru Sensei was and was not is that only when he was, right before he died, did we start to discuss inner Aikido. 
And, you know, I'd been already st studying Aikido with him for like 17 years. Right. And then all of a sudden, yeah, we got to start talking about the inner aspects of it. <laughs> you know, uh, I was having lunch with Kojima Sensei, Reverend Kojima from Zenshuji Soto Mission. And he told me that the teacher can only develop you 50%. And then you use that other fifty that fifty percent to develop your the other fifty percent. Interesting. And so you, if the teacher can only develop you fifty percent, that's all jitsu, right. right? They teach you to have the mindset to develop yourself physically, and then you use that same mindset to develop yourself mentally. Mentally. So if you go out and the teacher is a horrible person, they never got to the do level teaching, right? But if that if your teacher is living the way. That's a doe level teacher, right? And that's the thing I strive to be. Like, I think, oh, I'm not. I yell at someone, right? You're driving, you get all upset, you go, I'm not that person. Right. But that that's the hard part. Like, you know, for instance, and I talked a lot about technique. And I'm like one of the few people he, that he would say, what do you think about this technique? What do you think is the mechanism? Are they doing that in Japan? Who, who have you seen do that? And you know, even when he hated me, like, he'd be mad at me. We'd be sitting there watching a video. And then he would say, is that the way they're doing it in Japan? And I would go, I, I don't know. And he goes, yeah, I think this person. And I go, well, I saw this person. Yeah, I saw that too. You know, and you're like, he totally hates me. And he's asking me these questions. But I don't know of other people that he discussed technique with. Right. And then later later on, like that, that year before he died, is the only time he really started to talk about life. And Interesting. You, you know, and then he dies. <clears throat> and so you miss... You wish, I wish he was alive so I could be like, hey, this thing's happened. And Sensei, what do I do? Right. But, it, you know, he's gone. My mom's gone. You're on your own. And so you, that 50% that your teacher gave to you, you know, must use that. Right. To you have to yourself. capitalize on it. Yeah. Well, I think this is a really good spot to stop. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you all for watching or listening. And don't forget to like or subscribe to this podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us.